prayer that we can meditate on. So uh, uh, this morning, I just want to share uh, with you some thoughts on the death of the Lord Jesus Christ. Um, we call this Good Friday. Why, why is it good? Because bad things happened on this day. Uh, There's a lot of things happening that was, uh, some of it was very deeply painful, uh, like uh, Judas betraying Jesus, uh, one of the 12. Uh, another uh, painful thing is, is Peter denying Jesus. That's very painful. It is the way Jesus was judged false accusation thrown on him and the judgment rushed overnight he had three judgments all of them didn't find anything wrong with him but all of them decided whether you are guilty or not guilty we must punish you you know it's one of those days where uh, things where the judge has already determined the punishment before the case is closed and, 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 and that's part of what happened on that day. And Jesus brutally beating and, and then uh, stripped of his clothes, uh, taking uh, to Golgotha to be crucified. You know, when, when you watch a lot of the crucifixion movies, uh, Jesus Christ is on the cross and he's quite up. And the people are looking up to him. But really, in reality, that's not how crucifixions were. The crucifixion cross was about eight feet tall. So, and, and sometimes lower than that. So most of the time when you were crucified, you were on eye level with people. So you were crucified at a low level and people passed by and sometimes they would throw things at you and spit on you and all of that. And you can feel it when people are insulting you. And when Jesus was on the cross, people were insulting him. And, and saying all kinds of things about him and, and to think that his mother was, sitting, was standing right there uh, watching his son suffer and people just abusing the son. And, and yet Jesus went through that cross for you and I. It shows the depth of the sacrifice. So today as we remember all of this, I want to preach on uh, a very simple message. I've titled it, Seven Reasons Why Jesus Died on the cross seven reasons so seven reasons why Jesus died for us and I will give you those seven reasons and the scriptural backings for the seven reasons of course these are not the only reasons but I chose seven that I believe speak directly and strongly to the purpose of Christ's death the first reason is to show us the depth of God's love towards sinners. To show us the depth of God's love towards sinners. When Jesus died on a cross, it was, it was God wanting to show us how much he loved us. How much he loved us. And the scripture says in Romans chapter 5, and we've read it uh, this morning, Romans chapter 5 verse 6 to 8. For when we were still without strength, in due time, Christ died for the ungodly. For scarcely for a righteous man will one die. Yet perhaps for a good man, someone would even dare to die. But God demonstrates his own love toward us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. So, we can look at the love of God in two ways. The, the degree of a sacrifice in saving us from the penalty of sin and then the unworthiness of those he was saving. So the passage is saying, I mean, if you have to make a sacrifice, you know, of course I don't know how many of us here would die for somebody. Maybe a parent may choose to die for a child if it is really necessary and the parent is about 90, 80 years old, and then he may say, okay, I've finished my life anyway, so let me die for my child. I don't know how many husbands would die for their wives or wives would die for their husbands. But those are people you love, people who are close to you. But even that, it's very difficult for you to think of dying so that somebody would live. 
And then we may decide we want to die for our nation, which, which we dare barely do in Ghana. Um, or somebody who is uh, a bodyguard and he says, I'm, I, I'm ready to die for the person I protect. And because he's paid and it's his job, it's his training. But to die for people who are insulting you, who abuse you, who are not worthy, people who are the worst kind of people. And so the Bible says, whilst we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. We were at the lowest level. We didn't deserve it. And yet God reaches out and he doesn't just come to us to say, I love you. But he shows, I love you in a very practical way by sending his son, Jesus, to come and die for us. So in the death of Jesus Christ, we see the depth of God's love. We see how much God loves us. And Romans, as you read further, says, if God would do so much for us, what will he then withhold from us? If whilst we were yet sinners, when we were undeserving, he died for us, and now that he has saved us and made us righteous, what more will he not do for us? But the depth of God's love is seen that whilst we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. You know, there are certain people you wish that Christ would not die for. You know, you just look at them and you wish that even if Christ died for them, they shouldn't accept it. Because they don't deserve good. They are bad people. But God's love, it's towards them. It's one of the most sobering thoughts in life is to think that the most despicable person on earth is still loved by God. You can't think of it. Somebody who has murdered people, murdered children, mutilated their bodies, uh, was rapist. I mean, you can think of the worst human being that I can't stand them. There are certain people, if, if they stand in front of me, I will bust their head. I will bust their head. I mean, somebody who's a rapist and an arm robber and attacks a family, kills the father, kills the mother, kills the children, and he stands in front, I will bust their head. I wouldn't even want to hear their case. I'm not a violent person, but if such a person stands in front of me, I will knock their head out. But can you imagine God loves such a person? I can't love. People I can't love, he loves. People I hate, he loves. People I wish would vanish from the earth, he wants to take to heaven. That's deep love. It's love that passes all understanding. In other words, humanly, there is no one who can conceive of such a love. And yet, whilst we were yet sinners, including Judas himself, including all the most sinful people living in, in the world at that time and had lived in the world before and will live in the world after, all of them combined, Christ died for them. The depth of God's love in the death of Christ passes all human understanding. And that is the one, the first reason why Christ died for God to show us, I love you in a way you can't fully understand. It's bigger than your thoughts. The extent of God's love. That's why Christ died, to show us the depth of God's love towards sinners. Secondly, second reason why Christ died is to bear God's wrath towards us. Jesus died to bear the punishment that was due to us. Isaiah chapter 53 verse 10. Yet it pleased the Lord to bruise him. He has put him to grave. When you make his soul an offering for sin. Just think about this word. It pleased the Lord, God, the Father. It pleased him. It satisfied him to bruise him. 
to put him to grave. And he made his soul an offering. The God's wrath had to be fulfilled. Galatians chapter 3 verse 13. Christ has redeemed us from the curse of the law. Having become a curse for us. God's justice cannot look at sin and let it go. So God's wrath towards humankind is real because we have sinned. We blaspheme God. We, we destroy one another. We destroy the earth he has created. And the wrath of God is coming. It has to be appeased. You can't tell God, don't show wrath. Then he will not be just. You, he will not be just. He has to judge. And he decides, if I judge these guys, they're, they're finished forever. So I'm going to judge. I'm going to show the full extent of my wrath. But I'm going to pick somebody who did not commit the crime and I will pour all the wrath and the fury against him. And that's what happened. Jesus absorbed the wrath of God. That was supposed to be towards you. It's like you, you do something against somebody and he, he just lifts up his hand. He's going to slap you. And somebody else brings his face to take the slap. The slap has been given, but it didn't go to the one who deserved it. It went to an innocent bystander. That's what Jesus Christ did. He took the slap for us. He took the judgment for us. He took hell for us. He brought his face to take our punishment. The punishment was given. The wrath of God is satisfied. Justice has been done, but it was done on Jesus Christ. Now, normally, if you, if you make an innocent, you punish an innocent man, you've also created injustice. But Christ was God himself in the flesh. God cannot create injustice against himself. He bore our sin so that justice will be met adequately. The wrath of God kept at bay, satisfied. That is why God would say it is not his desire that anyone should go to hell because hell has been visited on Jesus Christ. And the only way to avoid hell is to believe that he took the slap for you. He took the wrath for you. And when you believe he took it for you, you are out of God's judgment and out of condemnation. So Jesus died because the wrath of God had to be poured out and had to be soaked in. And he came to bear God's wrath towards sinners. Number three, there is to cancel the record of our sins. Jesus came to die to cancel the record of our sins. He died to both take away our sins as well as the record of our sins. Colossians chapter 2 verse 13 to 14. And you being dead in your trespasses and the uncircumcision of your flesh, he has made a life together with him having forgiven you all trespasses. Look at verse 14 carefully. Having wiped out the handwriting of requirements that was against us which was contrary to us he has taken it out of the way having nailed it to the cross you know you can forgive somebody and still keep a record of the forgiveness of the sin and we all do it somebody does something it's okay I forgive you I forgive you I forgive you it's okay Let's be friends. So we are friends. And then a month or two later, he does something. You see, you see, you see, last month you did this and I forgive you. You see, you've done it again. That, that means you forgave, but you still kept a record. 
you know. It, 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 you know, it, it's like you, you go to, uh, you owe somebody, and uh, he, he, you go and pay the debt, but he still keeps receipts. <laughs> <laughs> record. So, so next time somebody comes and he's talking about you, he says, this guy, don't trust him more. I'll show you the record. He owed me for three years. He just settled it last week. But the record is still there. But when Jesus Christ died, not only did God forgive us of the sin, but the records of our sin, he wiped it out of the way. He nailed it to the cross. So in God's economy and account, there is no record of any sin he has forgiven. When he forgives you, he takes away the record of it. No human being has the power to do that. These days, especially in the digital age, we say the internet never forgets. You put something there and it is there. Even if when you delete it, it is somehow there. I don't know why they created an unforgiving technology. <laughs> technology that doesn't forgive. It always remembers. And you go and see old pictures of yours. You go and see things you posted that you wish nobody would come to find. Maybe you did it when you were an unbeliever. And now, you are a believer. You wish nobody would find out the things you used to post. It's like those people who used to love people and they would tattoo their boyfriend somewhere on their body. <laughs> it's a very risky thing. <laughs> tattoo the girlfriend. And then they have a nasty breakout. And the tattoo is still there. <laughs> you hit the girl, but every time you take off your shirt, there she is on your shoulder. Thanks be to God. He forgave us for our sins and he destroyed the record of it. And that is why Christ had to come to die. Under the Old Testament, sins could be forgiven, but the record remained. So they'll go to the, uh, to, to, for the day of atonement and the high priest will go make sacrifices of animals and, and for one year your sins are forgiven. But the record is still there. And because the record is still there, you still have to come and settle it next year. So every year they make sacrifice after sacrifice after sacrifice. But when Jesus Christ came, he made one sacrifice once and for all. Because there is therefore no record of that which he has forgiven. You may struggle forgiving yourself because you still may have memories of your bad ways. But if you truly brought it to Christ and it's under the blood of Jesus, in God's mind, it never occurred because he didn't just forgive the sin, he wiped away the record of it. That's the third reason why Jesus had to die the brutal death that he died. Reason number four, to obtain eternal redemption for all who believe in him. To obtain eternal redemption for all who believe in him. Romans chapter 9 verses 11 to 12. But Christ came as high priest of the good things to come. With a greater and more perfect tabernacle. Not made with hands. That is not of this creation. But with the blood of, not with the blood of goats and cows. But with his own blood he entered the most holy place once for all having obtained eternal redemption. Redemption is a very interesting word. It means uh, that something has been bought back. Something has been bought back. It's like what happens when you chapter 9, verses 11 to 12. But Christ came as high priest of the good things to come with a greater and more perfect tabernacle, not made with hands, that is not of this creation, but with the blood of, not with the blood of goats and cows, but with his own blood he entered the most holy place once for all, having obtained eternal redemption. Redemption is a very interesting word. It means uh, that something 
has been bought back. Something has been bought back. It's like what happens when you give your land or house or jewelry as collateral for a loan and then uh, you default on your loan so the house is now forfeited. It was yours but it's no longer yours. The land is no longer yours. Jewelry is no longer yours. But if somewhere in that process you are able to come by money you can go back and redeem your land and get your land back because you pay the price. So the word redeem means that something that has been lost or something that is lost is now restored to the owner. So it, it presupposes there is an owner, he lost something and the thing which he lost has been brought back. God is the owner. He lost us human beings through Adam and Eve and in Christ Jesus, he bought us back. But the thing about what Jesus did, he didn't just obtain redemption. Redemption is good. It's good. But he obtained something greater than redemption. The Bible calls it eternal redemption. That means that when he buys you back, you can never be sold back into slavery. It's eternal. His redemption means he redeems you and you can't be taken away again. He bought us eternal redemption. He saved us and saved us thoroughly, totally, ransomed us fully. Of course, it doesn't mean that after that you live your life anyhow. Because if you truly treasure what Christ has done for you, you would endeavor to live a holy life for him. But it doesn't also have to put us into a situation where you think, oh, if I lie, then I lose my salvation. I, I did something bad, I lose my salvation. I did something bad, I lose my salvation. If, some, if salvation is lost that easily, then it's not eternal redemption. Eternal redemption has serious consequential redemption. He saved us and saved us thoroughly, totally, ransomed us fully. Of course, it doesn't mean that after that you live your life anyhow. Because if you truly treasure what Christ has done for you, you would endeavor to live a holy life for him. But it doesn't also have to put us into a situation where you think, oh, if I lie, then I lose my salvation. I, I did something bad, I lose my salvation. I did something bad, I lose my salvation. If, some, if salvation is lost that easily, then it's not eternal redemption. Eternal redemption has serious consequential effects for our eternal destination. That is why when a person is born again, he has passed from death to life. And there is therefore now no condemnation for him. The born again believer has no, no likelihood of any kind of going to hell when they die. No likelihood. Most religions say you cannot be sure. They'll tell you, when you have gone, we still have to be doing sacrifices, prayer for you, that wherever you are, you will find your way to the good place. Some will say, you can't tell whether you go to heaven or hell because, you know, only God decides. And, and, and so, um, you know, we leave it in God's hands. But in Christianity, that's not how it is. We can know that we will not go to hell. Not because we are good people, we are smart people, we did the right thing, but because Jesus did the right thing on our behalf. And because of what he purchased for us, he gave us eternal redemption. And we have faith in him to provide us eternal redemption. And there is no shadow of doubt that when a believer dies, he is with the Lord. Because he has eternal redemption. Your eternity is secure in Christ Jesus. If you remain in him, you are eternally safe in Christ Jesus. To obtain eternal redemption for all who believe in him. Reason number five. <laughs> to 
to reconcile us to God. Romans chapter 5 again, verse 10 and 11. For even when, if when we were enemies were reconciled to God through the death of his son, much more having been reconciled, we shall be saved by his life. And not only that, but we also rejoice in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we now have received the reconciliation. First Peter chapter 3 verse 18. For Christ also suffered once for sins, the just for the unjust, that he might bring us to God being put to death in the flesh, but made alive by the Spirit, that he might bring us to God. Reconciliation is when people who were on two different sides are brought together. There's a story uh, from, I think, either the First World War, I think it was the First World War, one of those brutal wars uh, in Europe and it was a Christmas day and uh, both sides which were at war uh, felt that they needed to celebrate Christmas so they called a truce raised red uh, white flag on both sides I think it was England and Germany and uh, and so the war ceased for that day so both sides went they wish each other Merry Christmas, Merry Christmas. You know, went to each other's camp, ate some food, drank some uh, mineral, and, uh, you know, took some biscuits and sang Christmas carols, held hands, and hugged each other. And that was reconciliation. And then the next day, they started shooting at each other. <laughs> the war continued. Uh, but that's not what Christ did for us. When he reconciled us, we didn't become enemies of God afterwards. He reconciled us permanently to God the Father. And we are certain that the Father is on our side and we are on his side. Jesus Christ reconciled us to God, brought us close to God, and made us partakers of all that he has for us. That is the fifth reason why Jesus died. The sixth reason, reason number six, to disarm evil spiritual rulers and authorities. To disarm evil spiritual rulers and authorities. Colossians chapter 2 verse 14 to 15. Having wiped out the handwriting of requirements that was against us, which was contrary to us, he has taken it out of the way, having nailed it to the cross, having disarmed principalities and powers, he made a public spectacle of them, triumphing over them in it. I've covered this when I talked about life in the spirit, but you know, especially when you talk to Ghanaians and, and African believers, this, this is a very important thing. Jesus died and part of the reason why he died was because he had to go and confront evil powers on our behalf and destroy their control and effectiveness and resurrect to give us new life. And so in his death, he disarmed principalities and powers. He didn't kill principalities and powers. He didn't destroy principalities and powers. Principalities and powers are still there. But he disarmed them. There's a difference between somebody who is dangerous and armed. But if the person still hates you, but has no capacity to hurt you, then he has been disarmed. I will not say the devil doesn't hate you. He hates you and he will hate you till he's in the lake of fire. I will not say that demons and principalities and powers do not hate you. So far as you bear the image of God, they will hate you. It's like somebody who who sees you and say, you remind me of somebody. <laughs> and the person that you remind them of is somebody they hate. 
A woman looks at you and says, he looks like my ex-husband. Look at even his nose. And when you haven't done anything, you come to him and say, why is your nose like that? Why is your nose like that? Because you, you bear the image of somebody she hates. The reason devils hate you is not because of the family you came from. What kind of family are do you come from? That's nothing. Your family is nothing. In the scheme of, of things, eternal consequential matters, your family is nothing. Your achievement is nothing. Your degree is nothing. No demon will bother over you because you pass an exam. The only reason why they hate you because you remind them of the one who kicked them out. You are the image of God. And whenever they see you, they see and say, look at them. Look at them in Ghana. We should find a way to destroy them. And they do everything to destroy you. And they will try, but they are disarmed before Christ, they will plan and they can execute because they were armed. But after Christ came, he said, you can live your life by bring the gun, bring the knife, bring the arms. You can't use any of these things. You can hit them, but you can't hurt them. No, there, there is a video I, I, I watched. It's somewhat, it's, uh, you know, one of these uh, memes and uh, all kinds of things that circulate on the internet of a, of a young boy who was in a, in a kind of a zoo and he's playing, he's, he's facing uh, where the camera is and I suppose it's his parents who are taking the shot and behind him is a lion and the, and, and, and the lion looks at this boy, tiny boy, vulnerable and you see the lion just running, chasing very fast. And if you, if you watch it the first time, it's very terrifying because this boy doesn't even see the lion is coming. And the lion is coming and coming and coming to eat up this boy and then it hits a glass. Because behind the boy is a glass which we don't see. And the glass is thick enough to prevent the lion from eating him. So you can run what you want. You can hate what you want. But you cannot touch him. You can't touch him. You can't touch him. And that's what Christians should understand. The devil is still a roaring lion. He's a wounded lion. There are principalities. There are powers. But on that Good Friday. They were disarmed. They were disarmed. They may be in your family. They may use people. But they have been disarmed. And that is one truth Christians should understand. Because sometimes people say, you don't understand spiritual. Pastor, you haven't seen things. I have seen things. I have seen Jesus. I have seen his blood. I have seen his power. I have seen his redemption. What more do you want me to see? somebody's testimony that is greater than the testimony of Jesus somebody tells you hey, 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 your pastor you don't know there are demons and they and I've experienced it your story I should take your story and go and negate what Jesus Christ did because of pitiful you and your ignorance nobody's story no preachers Foaming on the mouth. Preaching. No preacher can arm what God has disarmed. Nobody. Because you see, if you're not careful, you leave what Christ has done for you. And you search what people say the devil has done for them. And you make what the people say the devil is doing your gospel. But if you are a true believer of Christ, your foundation is in Christ. And the Bible says, he disarmed, disarmed, disarmed principalities and powers, made a public show of them, triumph over them in it.
That's where the Christian is. If somebody chooses to be a witch, that is up to them. But they are disarmed. Somebody decides to take you to Juju, that is up to them. But they are disarmed. Somebody decides to put black powder in front of your house, that is up to them. But it is disarmed. Somebody puts white powder on your church chair in the office, that is up to them. The worst it will do, it will dirty your suit. But that is the worst it will do. But it cannot harm you. It cannot harm you. Because if it can, then the death of Jesus Christ is of no effect. Then today is not a good Friday. It's a mournful, sorrowful, terrible Friday. But we say it's good. Because on this day, 2,000 years ago, the arms of the enemy were taken away from him. He's still our enemy. He still hates us. He will still threaten us. But he can do nothing. He can do nothing. That's scripture. You know, I can do nothing except believe what God says. Because it is on the basis of scripture that I'm born again. It's on the basis of, how do you know you are a Christian? On the basis of scripture. How do you know God created the heavens and the earth? On the basis of scripture. Everything I know and believe is on the basis of scripture. And it is on the basis of scripture that I live. And scripture said, he disarmed. Disarmed. They may be in your family, but they are disarmed. They may be in your office, but they are disarmed. They may be moving around, but they are disarmed. They may be rushing and charging against you, but they are disarmed. And the final reason why Jesus Christ died. Number seven is to become our sympathetic high priest and helper. He became our sympathetic high priest and helper. Hebrews chapter 4, verses 15 to 16. For we do not have a high priest who cannot sympathize with our weaknesses, but was in all points tempted as we are yet without sin. Let us therefore come boldly to the throne of grace that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. Christ is our high priest. In the Old Testament, there was a high priest. The first Old Testament high priest, of course, was Aaron, and his line continued, and so there is always a high priest. The high priest is the highest of the priests. The priests are of the priestly families of the Levitical tribe. So there are about three families that produce the priest and then the high priest comes out and during the major celebration of Israel which is the day of atonement when the sins of the people have to be forgiven the high priest is the only one who goes to the holy of holies and he goes after they've made a sacrifice of an animal then he takes the blood of the animal and, and goes to the Holy of Holies where there is the Ark of the Covenant. On top of the Ark of the Covenant is the mercy seat. And he'll go and smear the top of the mercy seat to say that God be merciful upon the people. Atonement has been done. How was atonement done? An innocent animal has been sacrificed for the guilty nation. So somebody has borne the guilt. And his blood, this is the witness that the sacrifice has been made. And for that time, the sins of the people are forgiven. But as I said earlier, the next year, they have to go and do it. They have to do it every year because their account is still there. It has not been taken away. In Christ, it's taken away. But the important thing is that the high priest goes with the blood. Jesus is also a high priest. What is the difference between Jesus and the Old Testament high priest. The Old Testament high priest bears the blood of an animal which has suffered. He himself didn't suffer. He didn't die. The animal died. 
So he hasn't experienced the pain of the animal he's presenting. So he goes to present the animal, but the suffering was not by, done by him. Jesus Christ is a high priest. He didn't take somebody else's blood. He took his own blood. He himself became the animal who was brutalized and executed and his blood drained away from him. He takes that blood on his resurrection to go to the heavenly holy of holies, not Jerusalem, heavenly holy of holies and say, Father, the price has been paid. And the father says, accept it. And the Bible says that Jesus Christ as high priest is sympathetic. Why does it say so? Because the Old Testament high priest, he's not sympathetic because he didn't go through the suffering. And the second thing about the Old Testament high priest is that he belonged to the tribe of Levi or Levi. The Levites, out of whom come the priests, they were separated from the people. They lived outside the people. They don't live the life of the normal Israelites. Jesus Christ, when he came as a high priest, he didn't hide in a corner. He lived amongst us. He went through our lives. He understood our pain. And the Bible says he was tempted in every point like us, yet without sin. The thing about temptation is that when you yield to temptation, it ceases. But when you don't yield to temptation, it becomes more severe. So, Jesus Christ never sinned, but he was tempted. So what does it mean? It means throughout his life, his temptation level kept escalating. It kept escalating. It kept escalating so that one day he'll fall and it went on, escalated, 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 yet he never yielded. Then he went to die for us. And so the Bible says he's a sympathetic high priest. Because when you go through pain, he understands what pain is. When you go through suffering, he understands what suffering is. You go through betrayal, he understands what it is to be betrayed and still not have vengeance. It's a temptation. I'm telling you. When somebody has really, really done you bad, the temptation is, <laughs> you're also waiting. And anytime you pray, you say, Father, do something to them that they will know that I am your child. <laughs> and when we say that, we don't mean, Father, bless them so they will know I'm your child. We know, Lord, break their legs. And when they are, you are breaking their legs, remind them, this leg breaking is because of Mesotabo. You know, in, the, in the old mafia time, that is how it was done. When, when a mafia boss sends somebody to go and exact vengeance, you know, so they come and, and they're going to kill somebody, they will say, this is from Don Colone. Boom! So you know who authorized it. Because they want you to know as you are dying, as you are dying this is why you are dying they will break your leg and they say this is from Don Luciano boom who broke your leg Don Luciano so many times that's how we are we want God to we say Lord do something for them to them that they will know that I am your child that I serve the living God we don't mean God Bless them and tell them, I'm blessing you because of him. No, 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 no. God, split their head into two. But just before you do that, show them a vision. That their head is about to be split because they mess with me. It's a temptation to pray that prayer. Isn't it a temptation? All of us have, it's a temptation. But Jesus Christ overcame that temptation. He knows what it is to be betrayed. He knows all of that, but yet didn't yield. So when we go to him and we say, Lord, for what that person did, Father Jesus, Father Lord Jesus, <laughs> 
show him fire. He sympathizes. He hears that prayer. He said, hmm, my son, I've heard you. I know how you feel. I've gone through it. This is not how to solve these problems. So I've heard it. I won't answer. He's sympathetic. He knows why you are praying those prayers. He knows what you need is not vengeance. What you need is favor. What you need is blessing. So instead of killing your enemy, he will lift you up. Instead of destroying your enemy, he will bless you. He knows your prayer is misplaced. But he will hear you. He's sympathetic. He understands why human beings pray the kind of prayer they pray. Because he's been in a situation where he would have prayed that prayer. He never prayed that prayer. So when you pray it, he will hear it, he will answer. Because he understands human nature. He's our sympathetic high priest. When we are tempted, he understands. Even when we fall, he understands why we fell. And that is why when we come back to him, he doesn't throw us away. Because he understands the frailty, the weaknesses that we face in our world. And that is why he had to come experience our lives. Die the horrible death so that he can become a sympathetic high priest and helper. So the Bible says we come to him that we may obtain grace and mercy to help us in our time of need. When I'm in a time of need, I don't care an enemy dying. I need grace and mercy. I need God's help. I need a solution. I need God's blessing. I need God's favor. And when we come to him, that's what he gives us. Grace and mercy to help us in our time of need. Today as we Remember the death of Jesus Christ. We want to keep these seven thoughts in our mind. That is why his death day is a good Friday. Let's pray. <clears throat> Father, we thank you this morning as we think about Jesus Christ on this day of suffering and shame and pain being crucified, having been betrayed by a loved one, being denied and abandoned by loved ones, being mocked publicly, judged falsely, and yet he went the whole way to show us your amazing love towards us. And Father, let his death bear fruit in our lives and the victory he gave to us be seen in our lives may our lives reflect the victory of Christ Jesus and may we live every day fully aware of who he is what he did and what he gave to us in Jesus name Amen. 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 God bless you very much. Give Jesus a shout.